this morning's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13. And uh, in that chapter are many lengthy parables, parable of the sower, etc. But there's a two verse parable found in verses 45 and 46 that really, if you understand what the symbolism of it describes everything, it describes us, our hearts, Jesus' heart toward us, and what it costs him. Amen. And it is the parable of the pearl of great price. Matthew 13, verse 45, reads as such. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. Um, I, only, I don't really have um, a lot of announcements. I will say that Bible study last week was exciting. Yes. Won't you say? Yes. I told you guys it was going to be good. So um, I expect it to be just as good. And don't forget your homework is chapter 2 of the book of Acts. We um, started our new series on the book of Acts. And we learned a lot last week. Um, I got a feeling that this week we're going to get a little bit more intense. But um, it's all for the glory of God. Amen. So if you can come, 7 to 7.30 is prayer. And then from 7.30 to about 9, 9.15, depending on uh, how good Bible study gets, uh, we might go to 9.30. Um, and uh, just come. Come and get ready to learn. Guys, Sundays is great, right? You come with your family. But Tuesdays is an experience. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions. And it's an opportunity for you to learn the Bible. Amen. If I had to say the biggest flaw in the church today is a lack of Bible knowledge. And if you don't come to Bible study, um, you're going to be lacking in some of those areas. So do your best to come. Do your best. It's only, you're giving two, let's say two hours out of your day to come and learn the Bible um, out of a week. Um, and if you, if you want to talk about tithes, we always talk about money, but let's talk about tithing your time. Right? So if we want to talk about tithing your time, that means two hours in 40 minutes we should be giving God a day um, <clears throat> and I'm just asking you to give us two amen if you want to bring coffee and cookies then that extra 40 minutes is there but I'm just asking you to come and give us two amen so um, I ask that you come and invite somebody invite a friend um, it's really a good environment um, I, I will share this we had a visitor on Tuesday and it was interesting because um, he came, He left a little early, but he came to the realization that his mama knew the Bible um, simply because we started talking about something that she used to say that was biblical, and he never knew it was in the Bible until Tuesday last week. Amen. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So let's make sure we do that. Also, next week on Saturday, they're going to have a, a couples um, conference or a couples workshop. Um, I did ask Pastor Santos if we can be a part of it. He welcomes us to go. Um, I'm going to be interpreting it in English. So if you want to come, come. If you are a young couple, um, maybe you're thinking of getting married. You're not there, but you, you're thinking of getting married. Come, come and, 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 and be a part of it, um, it's, it's necessary, okay, it's necessary for us to hear uh, from people that are, that, that are doing it right, right, I haven't figured it out, um, but hopefully I'll get there one day where I can, I can be on my 40th and 50th anniversary and I can be invited to speak on what has, has been successful for me, because marriage is not easy, okay, for those of us that are married, that have been married or have tried it a few times, Okay, um, you know that it's not easy, but um, what 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 the great thing about it is that we have people around us. Okay, uh, I heard uh, it's funny. Um, I heard a, a man on a show, on a secular show. He's been married for like over sixty something years with his wife, and uh, Steve Harvey asked him, "So what was like? What was your secret to staying married um, for so long?" And he said. To always remind yourself that she's always right. <laughs> and I thought that that was a funny, a funny saying, and, and he made everybody laugh. But in, in, in actuality, I think what he was trying to say is, is that there are certain swords that we shouldn't be 
throwing ourselves to die on. That marriage takes a lot of compromise. So it doesn't matter if, you, it doesn't matter if you've been married 50 years or two days. Um, I believe that this will be a blessing um, for us all. And um, the last thing is remember that in June we have our workshops um, that we are going to be um, addressing certain topics which I think are are going to be a blessing. I'm pulling them up here because I forgot to um, tell you what those topics I think I told you guys what those topics are. So it's managing conflict, um, understanding change, and mentoring. Um, and it's talking about mentoring in the church and outside of the church. And that's going to be in English, and then the services at night are going to be in bilingual. So we're going to have a Friday, Saturday uh, Bible study, not Bible study, a uh, church service. They'll be in bilingual, um, and I think you guys will enjoy it. And, and I will say to the ladies of the church, um, Pastora uh, Jessica is a, is a, um, a godly woman. Um, she speaks English and Spanish. She speaks English because she was born in, and raised in New York, I believe, if I remember right. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, talk to her. Talk to her. And um, I think it will be beneficial for many of the ladies of the church. Amen. Those are my announcements. And um, we'll move forward. We'll go ahead and do our offering. And then from there, do our final song before we get into the word. I will say this. Prepare yourself for today's message. Amen. Today's message is, is titled Pride and Religion. Pride and Religion. And, and so I believe it's an important message for today's time. I know we're a small church, but I believe that we're getting ready to enter into a, a, um, a spiritual dimension that God is going to bless us to come in contact with many people. People. And if we're not careful, we can become religious and prideful, which is the fall of every major institute and of every person known to man is pride and religion. Amen. So let's pray for our offerings and we'll go right into uh, Sister Lizzie, can you do me a favor? Can you, can you do the offering tray for us? And uh, we'll go ahead and pray and um, go into the last worship song. Father, in, in your holy name, we come before you to give you thanks, honor, praise, and glory. And we just come before you just to give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks for giving us the ability to tithe and to give offering, Father. We, we, we're not focused on the amount. We're not a church that ask, Father. We're a church that just cares that when you give it, you give it with a good heart. Give it with a heart to sow a seed. We give it with a heart because you call us to be joyful givers and you call us with the heart to administer your finances according to your biblical principles. And Father, we just thank you for giving us that ability and we thank you for always supplying the needs of our homes and of this church. In the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. For those that are giving, you may come forward. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things for us. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things for us. The Lord's right hand is on high. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Now, the reason we live is to enter into the Holy of Holies. Amen. So we don't ever want to just have a song service. We want to have a worship service. Amen. I enter the Holy of Holies. I enter through the blood of the Lamb. I enter to worship you only. I enter to honor. I have. Let's sing that again. 
I enter the holy of holies. I enter through the blood of the Lamb. It's the only way. I enter to worship him only. I enter to honor. I am Lord, I worship you. Lord, I worship. right to him. Lord, I worship you. I worship you. Lord, I worship Hallelujah. 
just worship him right there where you're at. Raise your hands and just say, Lord, I thank you. Son and praise and glory, Father. For you are our King. Thank you, Father, Lord God. Thank you, Father, Lord God. Thank you, Father, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 12. And today we're going to be talking about pride and religion. And as you're getting ready, um, I will tell you that I came about this because in the last uh, two to three weeks or so, I've been um, following a mega church that is going through some scandal. Um, it is a worldwide known ministry. Um, the scandal includes many things, um, drugs, alcohol, uh, sex, power, manipulation. Um, there's a lot going on, and, and, and the thing is is that this uh, ministry is really uh, responsible for the culture and atmosphere of the churches today in the United States. And um, I, I, I understand we can all fall short, and, and trust me, I've been on that side of the road. Um, this is not uh, intended for me to downgrade a ministry. That's not what this message is about. But the reason I mention this, if you notice, I'm not mentioning the church name because that's not the essence of this message. The essence of this message is that... Um, what I have pulled out from the last couple of weeks of just reading and, and watching video and watching a part of a documentary uh, on this church is, is that the enemy uses power, money, and sex. Is those seems to be uh, the three things that um, if you come across a scandal in a church, it usually has to do with money, power, or sex. And, um, it, it, and it ties into something else. Um, it ties into the, the Love Thyself uh, movement, um, which is something that I found interesting because if you stay with me today, I'm hoping that I'm able to tie everything in. In, uh, because I was battling between chapter 22 and chapter 23, um, but I'm hoping I could bring it in today and, and kind of talk about this because I find it interesting that in chapter 22 talks about how, how Jesus tells them there's two great commandments to love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, and then in chapter 23, he's pretty much calling them hypocrites, uh, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders because of their pride and their boastfulness and their arrogance and, and, and splendor and, and all of these things that, that we see and the sad truth is, is that that's what we're seeing today. 
Um, it's, it, it, there's a reason why there's churches that are small and, and, and don't have a lot of resources and they're not full. Um, and then there's a lot, there's a reason why there's big churches and they're full because of their resources. And I'm not against a big church. So I want to make sure that, I, uh, that you guys understand my heart this morning. I'm not coming from a place that I'm bashing big churches. Um, I'm coming from a place that I am uh, making you aware that if we as a church ever become a big, a big church, right, or let, let's just say if we ever grow outside of what we currently are, we need to make sure that um, pride and religion does not become the stumbling block to our fall. So, so I, 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 I want to I wanna start that way because I, I want you to listen to verse number 12. And, and, and I'm going to tell you that I've never heard this word. I had to look it up um, when I first came across this word a few years ago. And, and in some Bibles, it's going to use the word humbled. Um, but in the translation I'm using, it's going to use the word abased. Okay, and, 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 and I want to read this in verse number 12. And you can stay seated, and the word of the Lord is already blessed. Matthew 23, 12. Then it says as follows. It says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. In other words, humbled. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That's, 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 that's all I'm reading today uh, because there's so much food and, and, and so many nutrients and vitamins in this one verse um, and I found it to be uh, kind of appropriate how Brother Scott you know I didn't talk to Brother Scott this morning but he comes out of the book of, uh, of Matthew and he talks about the pearl and he, and he gave a little bit of context of his point of view and I find it appropriate because it sets up today's uh, message of pride and religion and I, I have difficulty expressing this because I know that this is going to hurt some people's theological perspective on themselves and how they should approach a relationship with God. But it's important here because this verse destroys the, the movement of self-love. It destroys it. In fact, it, 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 it goes against uh, a scripture. You may say, but, but pastor, you just got done telling us that in chapter 22, Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thy love thyself. You see, you need to understand that loving thyself uh, does not start about you identifying the qualities that you think should be uh, brought out. It's not about your beauty. It's not about your elaborance uh, or your stature or your, your economical um, perspective or political point of view. And, and, and because the, the love you is all about self-maintenance. But the Bible says something that we have to be careful of. It says, for what good is it, and I'm paraphrasing this, what good is it for you to gain the world to lose your soul? And sometimes we're loving ourselves so much that we lose ourselves to self-love and we forget that the true essence of self-love is loving God first because you don't know what love is. And often when we talk about self-love and we, well, I need to love myself first, what you're really saying is I need to love Learn how to love God first so that I can understand where those holes are in my heart that I'm trying to desperately fill Amen. with outside sources. And, 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 and self-love really deals with pride. It's about, it's about you uh, giving yourself a pat on the back every time you do something because you're self-loving yourself because you feel that people are not loving you in a way that you feel they need to love you. It's a newsflash. I need, you to let you, I need to let you know this morning that the heart of man is corrupt and will lead you astray. It says trust no man, which means don't even trust your own heart. The pride of man is the cause of the fall from Adam throughout history. Every pastor, every, every, every minister, including myself, that have fallen, has fallen because of pride. You say, Pastor, this is a harsh message. It's not that it's harsh, it's the truth. Because 
We are a small church with big goals and big visions, but before we get to the big visions and big goals, we first need to understand the basics of following Jesus. And number one is, is that your pride needs to move out the way. Your selfish ambitions need to move out the way. And your religious views need to be moved out the way. I don't claim to be part of a denomination. I claim to be a part of the kingdom. Have you ever been asked that? Oh, 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 Sister Jesenia, what type of church is it? What are they asking you? They're asking you, is it a Baptist church? Is it a Pentecostal church? And let me tell you, people that ask you that are hung up on the type of worship versus if the word of God is being expounded upon in the correct context. I, I said this last week, I believe we need to worship God. We need to jump in the, up and down, lift up our hands, raise our voice, and, and be charismatic in our approach. But your charismatic approach can never outdo the essence of what God has called us to be. And that is loving one each other. Amen. Jesus tells them in this, if you, if you want to know the condition of today's church, I want to give you a homework assignment. Matthew 23. Read it today. Because Jesus is dealing with the religious and prideful people of the time, and he's telling them, you want to exalt the past prophets. You want to build up their tombs and worship their words. You want to sit on the seat of Moses. But yet you kill the very people that you're exalting. And in church, we do that today. Come on now. Let's see, I'll give you an example. Have you ever said, I know I said it, have you ever said, and I know some of you have said it because we talked about it in Bible study, so you told yourself, you told on yourself, have you ever said, well, man, if I lived in the times of, of, of the prophets, I would have never killed one. If I lived in the time of Jesus, I would have never been one of the one in the crowd saying crucify them, because I know better. Yeah. And Jesus tells them the very same things. You speak as if you were in the times of the prophet that you would have not crucified them, but yet you're the one that is sending them to the crucifix. Yeah. You're sending them to the cross. And then you want to exalt them. You know, there's a term called proselytize, and, and many people may not know what this word is. Um, and maybe you know what this word is, but for the sake of understanding, the word proselytize is pretty much in the times of Jesus was when somebody was converted to Judaism. And today, um, we still proselytize, but we proselytize them onto Christianity. We bring them from the world into Christ. But this is something that Jesus told the people. He told, he told the Jewish leaders, he says, you you, you spend all this time proselytizing them to become Jews, yet when they're Jews, you make them worse than when they were not proselytized. We spend all this time to bring people into church, and we get them to believe in Jesus, but then you make them worse than what they were. Have you ever met some mean Christians? Huh? You mean that man met some, some mean ushers? Not Sister Wilda, but just in case. Some mean ushers, right? Some mean musicians, right? Let me tell you something. It speaks to your true conversion because your fruit is demonstrating a level of pridefulness that supersedes the level of the love of God. And you can't say, I'm just loving on myself. No, you're prideful. When the Bible, once again, let me explain this. When the Bible says that you need to love thy neighbor as thy love thyself, is that you give them as much respect as you intend to receive. You give them as much love. And this is the thing. You love them in spite of their... Dot, 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 dot. Ellipses, right? Whatever you want to put in there. 
You want to know why it tells you to do that? Because God loves you in spite of your dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. But yet we put standards. They don't look like you. They don't sound like you. They don't act like you. So therefore, you don't want to love them according to how God told you. Can I tell you something? One of you is enough. I don't need more than one of you in the church because I might not be here. Uh See, people got offended just now. No, listen, you don't understand. Your attitude is enough. Your, 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 your complaints are enough. People don't need to be more like you. They need to be more like him. Yes. And, and the reason why you want to be self-loved is because people are not meeting you where you want them to be. Listen, I get it. I understand the root of what that means, but it's getting out of hand. Because when your self-love causes you to be nasty to other people, there's a problem. When your self-love creates pride in you, there's a problem. When your self-love overrides the commandments of God, there's a problem. Pride has always been connected to something negative. Prove me wrong has always been connected to something. Well, you ever heard this? I'm not prideful, I'm confident. But there's a difference between being prideful and confident. See, pride will trample upon others. Confident will help others along the way because you're not too scared of other people getting the glory in your behalf. That's the difference. A confident singer. But there's a difference between a confident singer and a prideful singer. See, a confident singer understands who they are, what they are in Christ. A prideful singer is insecure and concerned if somebody else is going to replace them. And if God calls you to be replaced, then that means you're going to get promoted. And sometimes you don't ever move up because you don't allow other people to move in. You don't. One of the biggest advices is that, that I ever got uh, was, Pastor, there are things that God can't give you because there are things you're not willing to let go of, and God can't hand something into your hands if your hands are full. So sometimes God is saying, I need you to let go of your pride in order for me to give you some humble pie. You, 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 you got to let go. God sometimes has to fire you before he can promote you. But there are people in church that, let me say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on, on, on the Mendez family in the back. There are people in church that go, no, that's my area, and that's my section. Oh, why are they sitting in my place? I, last time I checked, see, God brought new people and sat in that area so that you can move up. Then we find excuses. Well, I don't know who she thinks she is taking my chair. I don't know who he thinks he is singing and, and playing guitar. In church. I don't know who they think he is. And look, look at them. They've been here five days in church and pastor already gave them an opportunity. Well, that's because you never took advantage of the opportunity while you were here for the last five years. I'm preaching good, y'all. I, I'm going to watch this on Facebook today. <laughs> What you need to understand is, is that God won't grow what's self-absorbed. Yeah. Come on, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. He won't grow what's self-absorbed. Have you ever noticed that a sponge has a maximum capacity of what it can, it can absorb? And then after that it just is it, it's there. Right? And the reason that some of you are drying up is because God is saying, you've been so self-absorbed for the last couple of years, i got to let you dry up so I can pour something new into you. In other words, he has to break you down before he can build you up. You ever heard of this? 
You're not falling apart, you're falling into place. There's a song that talks about that. Sometimes you think that you lost your husband or your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or you lost whoever in your life or you lost a job and you think it's the end of the world and God says, no, it's the beginning of a new chapter. And, and, and we need to understand is that sometimes we make mistakes and we want to stay there and God is saying, no, I don't need seeds. Sometimes we're so prideful, we can't admit we just made a mistake. We will live and die with that mistake. Yeah. We will live and die in that mistake. And God say, look, just because you made a mistake doesn't mean you can't move forward. It means that you got to learn your lesson and then move forward. But see, there are people that are, have the mentality of Israel. They keep going around the same mountain because they keep thinking about Egypt. Right. Well, you keep thinking about what you had, what it could have been, what it should have been, but it wasn't. And it wasn't because it wasn't part of God's plan to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you holding on in pride? What relationship are you holding on to because you spent the last three years? What relationship are you holding on to because maybe you have a child with that person? That sounds kind of cruel, doesn't it? That sounds like, Pastor, you in my business. No, I've been there. I had to let go. I know what it's like to be a single parent. I was a single dad for two years with a, with a six-year-old and a two-year-old. We slept in our car. We used to walk to work, to school, and everywhere else. But we're so prideful that you're scared of letting go because you're so comfortable in your mistake that you're, you're scared of letting go and letting God fix what you messed up. And let me tell you that what the devil intended for bad, God can use for good, but you have to let go. You've got to remove pride out of your life. I remember when I went through my first divorce, I was like, God, you know, you're not happy with divorce. I'm not getting divorced. I'm not getting divorced. And I'm a single dad. I'm not getting divorced. But yet I was asking God to do better for me. Now, I know that this is going to cause controversy on social media. Yes, God does, is not pleased with divorce. But he's also not pleased with you being put under somebody's foot. He's also not pleased with you being mistreated. He's also not pleased with you being, being belittled and tormented and constantly reminded of your sins and of your past. I have a question. He's if also not pleased with you being you and you threw all of your sins into the sea of forgetfulness, then who has the right to bring up your past if God doesn't bring up your past? If God doesn't bring up your past sins, then why are you giving other people the authority to bring them up and throw them in your face? Yeah. Pastor, what does that have to do with pride? It has to do a lot. Because the reason it keeps coming up and the reason that it's still in your life, prominent in your life, is because you're still holding on to that pride of what could have been, what should have been, and what wasn't. You know what else is the world of? It's religion. Sometimes we allow religion to dictate our actions. And let me tell you something. I am not here to be your religious figure and your religious dictator. You're welcome. I'm not. Listen, biggest mistake that can happen in church, and I don't know why I'm talking about this, but I'm going to hit it anyway. You have a teenager that's pregnant, they have a baby, and they forced them to get married. So let me get this right. They made a mistake, and now you're going to make them become... And then you're going to say, well, the Bible says you should not be unequally yoked. Well, because they had a baby with the person, now you want to make them get married, and you don't know if that's the person has for them. So now you converted one mistake into two mistakes. 
because of religion, but because of reputation, or because I don't want the family name. Who cares about your family name? The only name we need to care about is the name of Jesus. That's the only name. I have a child that has a, that had a, I have a beautiful granddaughter that's the same age as my son. She's five days younger. So he became an uncle at five days. Right? And my child's not married. And I'm not on the phone, well, when are you going to get married? Because I don't want the Cintron name to be ruined. Guess what? I already ruined it myself. So I don't need to tell her that. I just need to tell her that. This is what I ask her. Is he treating you good? Is he treating the baby good? Is he taking care of you? Is he doing what he has to do? Yes, Dad. Then that's all I need to know. But I always remind them, if you're not doing good, and if you put your hands on my daughter, don't worry about 911, because I'm her 911. But I don't force her into marriage because you can't, if you force it, then all you're doing is causing a future stumbling block. That's right. I'm not saying that it can't work for you. Don't misunderstand what the pastor's saying today. But what I'm saying is, is that don't use religion as an excuse to justify a, another sin, another mistake because of your pride. Oh, well, they're going to mess up my daughter. My son is going to mess up the family name. Well, guess what? You messed it up before they did. Yeah. Oh, well, they're going to shame it. You know what? You shamed it. Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah, remember that time that you got blackout drunk and you don't remember what you did? I'm pretty sure that in between that period, you did something shameful. Yeah. Right? Or in the words of Floyd, well, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, well. And what I want you to understand is that Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here and he's saying, you hypocrites, you're telling people to live by the law, but you break it. You tell the people to dress a certain way and you do the opposite. You tell the people to give all they have, but you're not willing to give, not even a tittle. Can I tell you something interesting? People talk about how tithing is not in the New Testament. Have you ever heard about that? Yeah. Who's heard that tithing is not? Can I tell you what chapter tithing is in? In the very same chapter that Jesus calls them hypocrite. And it's in Matthew 23, 23, where he says that you give, you give your offering, you give your tithe, but you need to still do this. What is he saying? He says, yes, still give your tithe and still do your, and do your offering, but there's one thing you're forgetting, and that is to love people, and that is to to, to worship God and that is to serve others because it does you no good to give all your money but your heart is not there amen. you're religious amen, amen, amen. I don't care if you're the, the person that ties the most in the church because that money means nothing if your heart is corrupt amen All glory to God. Because what you need to understand is, is that the essence of pride, pride will make you make decisions that make you feel good temporarily, but put you in hell for a longer time than you ever intended. Oh, you don't believe me. Think about those one night stands. Oh, wait, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about those drugs. Let's talk about those relationships. There are people that have lost their marriages for a couple of minutes of pleasure and they regret it. They wish they can go back. If I can just take the time back. But your pride was more focused on self-love, and that self-love was focused on feeling good. And let me tell you something. Sometimes the truth doesn't feel good, but it's the medicine you need for your soul. Amen. You ever seen, I think there's a book called um, Chicken Soup for the Soul. You want to know what that chicken soup for the soul is? It's called the Bible. Amen. 
Let, let, can we be honest with each other? Have you ever been to a place where you just want to hear somebody tell you something good? Have you ever been there? In fact, you have a friend. I'm pretty sure you have a friend on your phone that no matter how much wrong you've done, you can call them right now yeah. and they'll tell you about why you're right and why they're wrong. Yeah. Why the people that did you were wrong. They'll never tell you about how you messed up, but they'll tell you about how everybody else messed up. And they're, what they're doing is, is that they're pouring into your pride. They're pouring into your religious ways. They're pouring into the things that God is trying to uproot from you. Hmm? Yeah. Listen. My grandpa, and, and, and I'm going to tie this in, right, so give me a second. My grandpa used to say this, you know, being a Spanish, illiterate uh, man, that this is the crazy thing about grandpa. Grandpa couldn't write, he couldn't spell, but he knew, let, let, let him be missing $20 from his money. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand, grandpa, you can't add, and you can't spell, you can't write your name, but if I take $1 out of your money... You know what's missing. The math wasn't adding up for me. Right? But he was full of wisdom. And this is, he would say, he say, son, friends aren't the ones that are there when your pockets are full. Friends are the ones that are there when your pockets are empty and will tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it. That's what my grandpa used to say. He goes, those are the friends you need. See, you, you need people, we need more people in church that tell you about yourself. But, but, but the Bible says we've got to love our neighbors. Well, you know what? I love you enough to tell you when you're wrong. I, I love you enough when I tell you you're out of character and you're, 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 you're being disobedient. And I love you enough to tell you that maybe your mom is right and you were wrong. I love you enough to even say, you know what, sister, your daughter's right and you're wrong. Because at the end of the day, truth is not about preserving a relationship. Truth is about building the relationship. And as your pastor, I'm here to tell you that if you can't allow me to give you truth and you get offended any time that I tell you you're wrong, then you're in the wrong church. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to call you out from the altar. Because that's the other thing, Brother Floyd. People, people are so religious that they'll say, well, the Bible says that you call, you bring two or three witnesses. Well, it doesn't say that you have to be the witness. Yeah. Oh, the Bible says you got to bring two or three witnesses. Yeah, it does. But it doesn't mean that I have to bring you as the witness. You don't have to see God scolding somebody for you to feel justified that they've been scolded. It's called pride. That's called religion. And as I was watching this documentary, I asked myself a question. Where were the people that would confront these individuals about their pride and about their false religion? And I will tell you that if we don't have people in here that are willing to confront each other when they're wrong, how are we going to have people when we're bigger that are going to be able to, co to confront those that are wrong? That's right. yeah. But see, we live in a time and in a church that we're so worried about whether the guitar is out of tune versus if the heart of a person is out of tune. And I, I'm a firm believer. Listen, there's a song. There's a song called The Heart of Worship. Do you guys know what that song is? I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read some of the lines. I came prepared, see? It says, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that would bless your heart. I bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you require. You search much deeper within to the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Yeah. Do you guys know why this song was written? 
Because that's the other thing. Nobody, people sing songs that are written by secular artists that are being played in church, and you don't even know the root to the song. And you're like, man, I'm exalting Jesus. No, you're exalting yourself. When the church, listen, when the song deals more about your feelings than about God, it, there's a problem. Worship does not include you. It includes God. I'll say that again. Let me rephrase it so that people don't misunderstand me. When the song is about your feelings before God, there's a problem. This is why the song was written. If, 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 and I might have some of the details wrong because I haven't talked about this in a couple of years. Um, I believe the song was written in, in, it was written in Europe. I don't remember the country. And what it was is that this church became so big because the talent of the music, of the singers, it was just so great that people started to just show up by the thousands to the church. But the pastor would sit down, and as he saw his church grow with thousands of people, hundreds of worshipers, and he sees them, that the popularity of the musicians and the artists, he felt troubled in his heart. So he decided to sit everyone down. And I want to say that it was a course of two or three months. There was no songs in the church. And of course, people were wondering, what's going on? And he told the music leader, we're not going to get back up and sing until we get worship right. Amen. Now, can, can I just put myself in his shoes for a moment and just take it from the, from the prideful? The prideful part of me would be like, well, the church is growing. I'm doing something right. right, 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 right. Not all growth is good growth. That's right. Weeds grow. Yeah. Weeds grow. Can I tell you something? Some of the most prettiest flowers are weeds. Yes. <laughs> They're weeds. Right? It's just like when, when I, I remember my kids, they would go like, I want to get flowers for mama. And, and, and I'm like, where do you want to go? I want to go over there. Look at how pretty those are. I'm like, God, those are weeds. <laughs> but they, 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 the little kids didn't know any better. They went off of what they were seeing. They were stimulated by the bright colors. And there's people in the church that they're just stimulated by the music. They're stimulated by, by the experience and not the encounter. You see, there's a difference between an experience and an encounter. An experience will, will, will dwindle away when you leave. An encounter goes home with you and transforms you. There's a difference. That's the difference between religion and pride. And our relationship with God. See, pride will give you a temporary fix. It's a band of rushing heart. Religion will give you the appearance. Let me tell you what religion is. If you don't do this, I want you to try it. Buy one apple at the store. Just one. Buy the shiniest apple at the store. Right? And then I want you to take a little brush or a little, even a butter knife, and just start scraping away. Notice that that apple is naturally not that shiny. Wax. That's what it is. And guess what? Wax is not good for you because you're like, mm mm. Ah, this apple is good. But you're eating the poison. And there's many people that are eating the poison of religion and they're feeding their pride. The reason you were attracted to that apple is because it made you feel good. And pride is all about how good you feel and self-serving and self-loving. But God's love is different. It's not about self-serving. It's about serving others. And people are like that in church. Well, this pastor told his worship leader, we're not going to do this. You know, I want to say we're about two to three months. So you're looking at about eight weeks of no music in church. 
Listen, I know that as a church we've been here, here we struggle with music, right? We've done everything from, from being with the Spanish church, helping us to acapella, to, to, to this, to that. Now we're here, and guess what? It's a struggle, right? But the essence is, is what I'm trying to get people to understand is that we need to stop focusing on the people and the instruments and start focusing on God, and worship will naturally come. Yeah, yeah that's right. But true worship can't come unless there's unity. Right. If one note is off, it throws the rest of the band off. You know what I've noticed? For me, this is me. I can't talk about it. Nobody else. I, I, I've, I've had experiences in churches where, where the worship, the, the singers sound beautiful. Celine Dion style, you know, uh, Whitney Houston style, uh, the musician, the, com the composition, it's just on point. And there's nothing there. It's like a beautiful cup that's empty with no substance. And then I've been to churches where they barely, they know how to play two notes on a drum. Boom, 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 boom. And if you go to Central America on the piano, is ding, 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 ding. And if you have a corito, ding, 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 ding. It's the same beats, right? But, but the thing is, everybody is united. Right. And they're like, you know what? Sister sounds pretty bad, but I'm going to sound bad with her. So we might as well just sound bad together, and God is going to be pleased with that more than having this orchestra that's divided and bitter and talking about each other and no relationship with each other. Amen. Amen, amen. If you've never had that experience, I invite you to come on a mission trip with me, and I guarantee you it will change your life. Amen. The music is out of beat. Listen, have you been have you been to Honduras? Have you been to a church in Honduras? Yes. Have you have you been to the church where the drum is going like this, right? But the people are clapping like this. Have you ever had one of those? Yes. Or 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 the or the drums going, and the people are like, <laughs> isn't it weird that even though they're out of beat, the Holy Spirit, you feel it. You taste it. You desire it. Because true worship is not about how many strings are out of tune or in tune. It's about the condition of the heart of the person clapping. So maybe my talent is not clapping on beat, but my heart's with God. And maybe I don't sing good, but I'm coming from a place where I put my pride aside, and it pleases God. Now, it's wonderful when the talent matches your heart. But right now, the talent doesn't match the heart. And I'm okay with that, because I'd rather have a heart that worships than a heart that's not worshiping, and you sound great. Well, guess what? You're going to sound great in hell, because your worship was never true. Think about that. And the pastor went about eight weeks without music. The heart of worship. And this song was written by the music leader. And they sang this song as the very first song when they came back to church and introduced worship. And that's why it says, when the music fades and everything goes away, and it says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. That's what the song says. This song was the worship leader and the music team saying, God, forgive us because we made it about us. We were more prideful and religious in the way that we were thinking. We made it about us feeling good and the atmosphere feeling good. And sometimes the truth doesn't make you feel good. Right. Listen, if you're leaving this church... Feeling good every Sunday, I'm not doing my job. Amen to that. Seriously. 
If you don't leave Matt at least twice a year with your pastor after he got done preaching, he's not a good preacher. And I know I've got a few of you, Matt, so I'm doing good so far. Right? But that's the truth. For, for, for the people that have their mama here, does your mama always make you happy? Does your mama get on your nerves? But you know that she, the, the thing is, you know that there are times that she doesn't make you happy and she gets on your nerves. Not because she's trying to be intentional and getting you mad, but because she loves you enough to let you know. And that's what church is too. We have to love each other to say, you know what, Sister Leslie, you're wrong. You know what, Sister Wilma, you're wrong. But there's another side to that. Don't just tell them when they're wrong. Tell them when they're right too. So mom, I'm helping y'all out. Mom, let them know when they did good. Let them know when they did good too. Because see, the religious people will tell you about your sin, but they'll never tell you about your victories. And prideful people will always keep you down and never pick you up. Because they always want to be in the position of authority. Listen, I had a, a brother one time, and I got to sit for a moment. For those of you that know, know. Um, he told me one time, he walked into my room, Sister Jusania, into my office. He said, you want to know why all these women are dressed the way they're dressed in this church? And I was already not in a good, my Jesus meter wasn't full. Let me just put it that way. My Jesus, the Holy Ghost wasn't all the way in there yet. Right? He says, because you allow your family, your, your wife, to come dress with pants. And that's why all these women are coming with tight pants in the church. I'm serious. I'm serious. Don't look at yourself. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm, ta I'm talking about a, a situation that happened. And I said, excuse me? He said, yes. You're too scared. And, and these, these women, they're being like Jezebels. And I'm like, good God. <laughs> and this was also a man that you couldn't tell him he was wrong. Because he had a scripture for everything you said. See, this is when you know when religion and pride are connected. When they give you a scripture to justify what they think. And this is what I said to him. I said, brother, where in the Bible does it say that a woman can't wear pants? Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy that a woman should not dress like a man and a man should not dress like a woman. I was like, do you have any idea what that means? Yeah, that a woman can't wear pants and look like... I was like, I uh, just want you to know, the word pants comes from the word pantaloons, and pantaloons have not been around for more than 600 years. So guess what? When Deuteronomy was written, there was no such thing as pants. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with pants. I said, in fact, you are actually more wrong than that sister because if you want to be biblical, you need to have a skirt on because everybody wore skirts in the olden times. Yeah. And you know what he told me? He goes, you just want these women to be rebellious. And you know what I told that man? I said, uh, brother, I think you need to step out of my office because I am done having this conversation with you. You see, sometimes we need to understand that there are some people that are called reprobate. Mm -hmm. That they have what's called a reprobate's mind. Does everybody know what a reprobate mind is? If you don't know what a reprobate mind is, I'm going to give you an example. Because people that are prideful and religious have a tendency to have a reprobate mind. Sister, what color is this? No, it's not. It's white. And then the sister goes, no, it's black, Pastor. I'm going to show you. And she, she pulls it up on the dictionary, the definition of black, what black looks like. She matches the colors. And I say, no, nope, you're wrong. It's white. You see, that's a person that has a reprobate mind, that it does not matter what you tell them. God themselves can come and tell them that it's black, and they still will argue with God. That person has a reprobate mind. That person is so full of pride and religion that no one can change their mind. And Jesus was dealing with reprobate minds. 
In fact, he called them this, white washed tombs. Do you know what that means? It means that, have you ever seen a tomb, and have you ever been to a cemetery, and you see this beautiful mausoleum, and it's made of ivory and marble, and has flowers, it's beautiful! But inside, it's just full of dead bones. There's no life. And he's calling them whitewashed stones because he's telling them, you have the appearance of being full of life, but you're just reprobate. You need to be humbled. You need a lesson in what it means to humble yourself. And listen, Jesus tells us in the book of John, he says, for I need to decrease in order for God to increase. But in church, we're so busy increasing people and decreasing God because God hurts our feelings. Come on now. I think I'm going to make a shirt. I'm serious. I think I'm going to make a shirt, and hopefully I'll get a few people to buy here. We'll make whatever proceeds can go to missions, and it's going to say, God hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm serious. Because the thing is, is that I think God needs to hurt our feelings a little bit more sometimes. But when he hurts your feelings, stop pointing your fingers at everybody else. Can, can I tell you this? Religion will cause you to look for scripture to justify how you feel. Relationship in Christ will cause you to accept the scripture that made you feel like you feel. Pride will make you look for justification according to the word of God. Humbleness will make you look internally to search what else you need to remove so that God can fill you more. So I, I, I want you to understand. You want to know the condition of church? Read Matthew. Read Matthew 23. You can't love God with all your heart and all your might if you're so concerned about loving yourself. In fact, if you don't know how to love God, you're not going to know how to love yourself. People are going to get mad at me, and it's okay. It's okay. I didn't write it. I'm not the author, just a messenger. Right? But the truth is, is that the church has a pride issue and a religious issue. You know, I, I've said this before, don't be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. I've said this a lot of times. But there's another one. You can't be so grounded to the ground that you lose your connection with the Spirit. You have to find that medium where you are who you are but who you are doesn't override who God is. It's not God's job to exalt you. It's your job to exalt Him. Amen. The computer doesn't give you the commands. You put the commands into the computer. But man, sometimes we are so logical and so hurtful and full of venoms. Listen, he even tells them that they're that they're snakes. Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, "You are snakes." Can you imagine Pastor Jeff calling somebody a snake in church? That would be a scandal. <laughs> and the, the, the truth is, is God is trying to get us to to be at a place where He says, "Listen." It's time for us to get to the heart of worship. I challenge the people that are singing in the church to go and look up that, look up that, that song and look at the lyrics, the heart of worship. I, I, would, I would dare tell you. Look, I have to read this again. It says, 
I bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within to the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. Don't come to Sunday service because of the pastor or because of mom or because of dad or because of family. Come because it goes a lot deeper than that. It goes with your relationship with God. You know, I, I, I become very proud of members, and I don't, and I don't say this in a prideful way, right? It's kind of sad when you say proud, but prideful way. But what I mean by proud, that I am, it brings joy to me and hope when a member can come to me and say, Pastor, I just want you to know that I'm tired. And I've decided that I just got to let God take control. And a part of me, I'm like, yes, that's what I've been waiting for. Yes. Like, I want to jump up and down. And you say, well, Pastor, why? I was like, because they're getting it. They're getting it. And, and, and they, they, don't, they don't say this, God, uh, Pastor, I want to serve you in church. That's not what they say. They don't say, Pastor, I want to give all of these burdens to you. No, they say, Pastor, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of holding on to the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the anger. And I just want to give it to God. And I want to worship Him. And I want to serve Him. And I want to be better for Him. And in my mind, I'm like, yes, God. And I admit, that's a little prideful. But a part of me is like, man, they're getting it. I've had that experience in these last couple of weeks where I've had people come to me and say, I'm tired. I'm tired of holding on. See, holding on to pride is work. It's a lot of work. It gets heavy. And you mean like, oh, Pastor, it's not that big of a deal. You know what I learned in the military? That a pencil can weigh a ton if you hold on to it long enough. I got punished one time by a drill sergeant. And he did something that was inappropriate. So I said, I'm going to the commander. I'm going to tell him what you did. And his answer to me was, wrong answer. So he made me sit down and do the motorcycle. Do you guys know what that is? That's when you sit against the wall with no chair. So literally you squat and you have the wall supporting you. And he has you put your hands out. And he has you bouncing up and down like you're on a motorcycle against the wall. And you got to go broom, broom. He's like, ride the motorcycle. You talk about fire in your legs. And then I got so mad, I said, Ooh, not only am I going to tell him, but I'm going to tell him about this too. And he's like, I got something for you, Private Cintron. And he went and got a pencil. And in my mind, I'm like, <laughs> a pencil. And he's like, I want you to hold the pencil while you ride the motorcycle and hold it like this. <laughs> a pencil. Brother Scott, I had tears coming down my eyes and I was shaking. And he's like, you better not drop that pencil. But that pencil felt like it weighed. Why am I giving you this illustration? Because that's what pride is. That's what religion does doesn't feel like a big deal but you carry it around long enough it starts weighing you down if you don't understand that illustration let me give you another one have you ever been to the beach and get one little grain of sand in your shoe isn't it interesting how that one grain of sand will change your walk that one grain of sand can cause so much pain 
Pride and religion are like that grain of sand. It will change and alter your walk because it doesn't belong there. You don't heal until you remove the pebble or the green from your shoe. And God is telling us today, you need to remove that pebble of green, that, 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 that little green in your shoe, that's pride and religion. Oh, oh wait, I, I, oh, religion? What do you mean, Pastor? Religion, you know, like, oh, that's not how I was taught in the church of God. Well, are you in the church of God today? No, so leave that over there. Well, that's not how I was taught in the Southern Baptist. Are you in the Southern Baptist? No, so leave it over there. See, we need to stop identifying ourselves to a religion and a denomination and start relating to how does God want us to do it? Because God requires you to move or remove your religious affiliations and remove your pride in order for you to truly be walking in his calling. And I close with this. Do you know what happens when we don't remove religion and pride from our walk? We become the snakes. We become those vipers. We become that, that angry usher. Not Sister Wilda once again. <laughs> Just, I say that again. You know that angry usher, right? You know that angry usher? If you haven't had one, just stay in church. You'll, you'll come across one at least once in your life. Gum. Yep. Uh -huh. Gum. We have rules. We have rules. <laughs> right? You know, you can be choking because you, and you're coughing, and you take a drink of water, and that Mina should be like, you're not supposed to have drinks in the church. <laughs> you know? And, and what that usher doesn't realize is that they're a porter. Because the Bible doesn't recognize. I said this before, but I'm repeating it again. The Bible doesn't say usher. It says porter. And a porter is the person that defends the entrance, but welcomes those that are called to be there. Yeah. But sometimes we're so busy defending territory that God never said was yours. There's a, I know the sisters will know this, that he, he's a, he's a well-known uh, Central American preacher. He has probably the largest church in all of Central America. His name is Cash Luna, right? I, I'm not a fan of his, just hashtag I'm not. But he said something one time that really caught my my, my really caught me. He says, you know, I have members here that always sit in the, in the same place. And can you believe they complain to the ushers because somebody, a visitor came and is sitting in their chairs. And he says, I'm this close of just tearing up all the chairs and making people stand. <laughs> right? He goes, and then just to mess them up, maybe I leave the same chairs, but I should have the maintenance people come and change all the colors of the chairs so that nobody knows what chairs is theirs. <laughs> that sounds crazy. That, that sounds crazy, right? And, and, but stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> there are people that are in church that are religious that way. Yes. That church has to be prayer, worship, lecture, offering sermon. If you deviate from there, where's the Holy Spirit? And can I tell you something? That when I remove my pride and I remove my religious thinking and allow God to take care of service, it doesn't matter if the preaching comes first or the preaching comes last, but some of the most glorious services I've been in have been the services where we just put our religious beliefs away and our pride away and let God take control. I remember one time I ministered. I have it, it happened here. One of the times I preached here. I don't know if you remember, Sister Maribel, where I ministered before I preached. I did an altar call before I preached. 
And to this day, that altar call has had a bigger response than any other time that I preached. You see, because God was moving me out the way, he, didn't, he wasn't allowing me to contaminate the atmosphere and make it about, ooh, wow, I preached so good the people came. No, he removed me out the way. Because he wanted to deal with the people. He was not going to allow that my pride took his glory for what he was doing in the people. And guess what? God will remove you out the picture before he gives you his glory. Understand that. Are y'all enjoying yourself today? Amen? Y'all ain't shouting like I was used to. In closing... In closing, verse 24 says, Ye blind guides, which strain at the gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> I read that, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> when I, you know, when, when I heard you first come, you're like, what does that mean? You know, the holiness movement, they, 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 they want you to look a certain way, right? talk a certain way, they don't want you to have makeup and they don't want you to have earrings and Sister Will, does she go to hell because she has short hair? Yeah, I'm serious, that's what they would do. Oh, she cut her hair. Who cares about if she has a medical condition? Who cares about if she has a situation going on in her life? Who cares about that? Oh, Brother Scott came in shorts. Oh, Brother Scott, you're going to hell. Religion. You see, yes, you should come a certain way, but God is concerned about how you come into his house and how you leave. Because it does you no good to have the long hair and the long pants and all of these other requirements. Because it's saying what it says here. You're, you're straightening the nap to swallow the camel. It's like you're so concerned about the outer appearance that you're forgetting the biggest thing and that matters, and that's the heart of the person. Yes. I don't care about your hair. I don't care about if you want to come to church with purple or blue hair or shorts with no socks. I don't care. Now, if you're up here, I'm going to say there's a uniform. Right? If you're up here, there's a uniform. Right? You don't want to be, be up here in some poom poom shorts. Right? We want to make sure that we see God's glory, not yours. If you don't understand what that means, we can talk after church. Okay? Yeah. So we need to understand that. And what God is saying here, Sister Rebecca, is, is that we are so concerned about the small things uh -huh. yeah. yep. that we let go by the big things, which is the condition of the person's heart. Uh -huh. So I hope that today you take this from this message. This is my summary. That it doesn't matter how much religion you've been a part of. You see, when people tell me, well, I've been in church all my life. The next question is, have you been in religion all your life or have you been in a relationship with God all your life? Because there's a difference. You know the movements. You know the words. But have you had the encounter? And can I say something as I, I leave? Some of us need to be reminded of that encounter because we haven't had an encounter with God in a long time. And you'll know when you have that encounter. You'll know because it changes you. You want to know if you're in a religious church? Don't judge it by how you dress. Judge it by how you're acting. Judge it by the love that you're sharing. 
Are you loving the person that talks about you? Or are you talking bad about them too? Are you forgiving those that do you harm? Or are you plotting to make them fall? I, I know a person in this church, in this church, overall, including Potter's House, Casa Life Farero, they want to see me mess up. Because they've said it. They don't know that I know they said it. But guess what? In these last two months, Brother Floyd, I don't know if Jesus has been giving them some special Kool-Aid. But that person's been extra nice. Right? That person wouldn't shake my hand. That person which would hug my wife and give me a, foot, a fist pump. Oh, COVID. Wait a minute. So there's no COVID for my wife, but there's COVID for me? So I decided... I can't be religious and I can't let my pride get in the way. How you doing? Uh And they would look around. Uh How you doing, Pastor? Uh I'm not saying this to cause an issue. I'm saying this because you judge by the fruit of the tree. And not every tree that looks well-dressed has a fruit that you can eat from. There are berries that are yummy, and there are berries that will kill you. For those of you that are into, don't understand that, there are mushrooms that are good for the diet, and there are mushrooms that will make you hallucinate. Some of y'all catch that later. (laughs) What I'm trying to say is is that some religions will make you hallucinate into thinking you have a relationship. While others will help you build a healthy relationship and you know you have a relationship. Where are you? Where are you at? Close my notes because I'll keep going. God is doing something great in this church. But we have to remove the religious spirit and pride. Religious spirit brings division. Pride brings fall. Pride comes before the fall. Why did Satan fall? Because of pride. God doesn't want to see us fall. But he needs us to decrease so that he can increase. Let's stand to our feet and give the Lord a hand clap if we can. Were you guys blessed today by the word? Amen. Were you blessed by the worship today? I was. I was and I thank the sister. I know you'll be back next week again. Yeah? Okay. I'm good. Yes. All right. So they sang, they sang wonderfully, um, and, and we're going to keep going. Um, the, the Goldens weren't here. They were out of town, but I know they were hooked up onto the page. Um, remember, invite somebody on Tuesday, and um, come, come, come. You know, you have the baby, let the baby come. Come. He needs Bible study too. You you know. So just just come. Just come and, and get ready to read the word. We let me tell you something about our Bible study. We have some conversations, y'all. And we have some conversations that make you mad and happy and excited. And when you leave, you're mad, happy, and excited. <laughs> And I'm happy when that happens, Brother Resto, because that means that you're paying attention and you're asking questions because we have people that come from different theological schools. But at the end of the day, I want us all to learn together. And that's what's important. Let's pray. Father, we just want to give you thanks, honor, praise, and glory. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for this word. Thank you for using me. And and thank you, Father, Lord God, for just this wonderful congregation that you have put before us. Father, we ask that you bless everyone that was on Facebook Live and YouTube connected. We thank you, Father, Lord God, because we know you're doing something great in this church, Father. All glory and all honor is for you. We thank you and we love you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
amen and amen. Hug somebody and tell them I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. See you guys Tuesday night, chapter 2 of the book of Acts. God bless.